After the initial confrontations of the Cold War with the Berlin blockade and the Korean War, there were a series of events that took place during the 1950s and 60s that threatened to bring the world to an, a third world war. We have seen how the United States became anxious and afraid because of the Cold War. We saw it with McCarthyism. We saw the video of duck and cover in case of an atomic attack. There was a true fear that if another world war started, it would wipe out mankind. Building reinforced bomb shelters in the backyard and providing bomb shelters in public buildings became the norm during the 1950s. This fear was made very real to the children of the 1950s with the duck and cover exercises and things like that. You may have seen the uh, Tom Hanks movie, Bridge of Spies, where his son is sitting in the bathroom plotting out if a bomb falls, how many people is it gonna kill? This is a big part of what will happen in the 1960s because as these children become teenagers and young adults, they see this possibility of an atomic war as real, and they are reacting to that fear. One of the preparations made in case of war was President Eisenhower's sponsorship of the interstate highway system. You notice here it's not just interstate highways, it's also defense. He had seen in Germany during World War II how effective the superhighways, the autobahns were for Hitler to be able to move war materials around. And he envisioned the interstate highway system as the same thing. In fact, parts of the interstate highway system were built to be used as runways in case of war. Long before spy satellites, the United States felt the need to try to figure out what was going on in the Soviet Union. And so they had a plane called the U-2 designed to fly higher and faster than any previous plane. The underside of it was lined with cameras and the CIA would fly these planes over Soviet territory and take pictures of what the Soviets were doing so that the CIA would have a handle on what the activities of the Soviet military were. The U-2 program was of course top secret and the United States was running it through the CIA so that they could deny that it was American military doing this. The plane was designed to fly too high and too fast to ever be shot down, they thought. However, the Soviet Union shot down a U-2 plane. President Eisenhower said he didn't know anything about it. It was not the United States spying. So the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, pulled out the wreckage and showed it to the press. In that wreckage were parts made by Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas. Then Khrushchev brought out the pilot, Francis Gary Powers, and displayed him to the world press. Now the U-2 pilots were CIA and they were supposed to kill themselves rather than to be captured. Francis Gary Powers did not take his suicide tab tablet and therefore was right there to prove that Eisenhower was a liar. 
both sides in the Cold War came to believe that having better arms was a deterrent to the other side to prevent them from attacking. And therefore you had an arms race. Who could have the biggest and baddest and fastest and, and most deadly missiles, atomic bombs, all that kind of thing. On the theory that if one side knew that it was superior to the other, then it would be more prone to attack. But if both sides stayed pretty equal in their firepower, neither side would attack for fear of losing. Perhaps the closest the world came to an atomic war was over Cuba. Cuban dictator Batista was corrupt. He was brutal, but he was pro-American and therefore the United States supported him. Opponents to Batista rose up in revolution, led by Fidel Castro, and they won. They overthrew Batista. And so Fidel Castro became the head of the government of Cuba. Castro needed help to rebuild Cuba. And so he came to the United States to get help. Here he is meeting with Vice President Richard Nixon. The United States was more than happy to help, except that they had one condition based on the Cold War. And that was that Castro had to keep all communists out of his government. Well, because the communists had played a role in his victory in the revolution, Castro did not feel like that he could do that. Therefore, he rejected the United States condition. When Castro refused to give in to the United States demands, the American government began to look for ways to overthrow Castro so that someone else who was friendly to the United States could replace him. The CIA put together a group of Cuban refugees who had fled to Florida after the defeat of Batista and formed them into a secret army with the purpose of invading Cuba and overthrowing Castro. They invaded at the Bay of Pigs and it was a disaster. Castro's forces pretty much wiped them out or captured all of them. This convinced Castro that he could not trust the United States not to invade Cuba, and he needed help to defend his nation. Since Castro had come to see the United States as the threat to his power, he turned to the United States' enemy, the Soviet Union, for help. Castro was not an avowed communist, but he feared the United States would invade Cuba and take it. And so he made a deal with the USSR, and the Soviet Union began to provide weapons and defense mechanisms for Castro and Cuba. The arms race had turned into a contest, not just who had the biggest bombs or the most bombs, but who had the best and most effective delivery systems. Each side began to develop missiles to deliver atomic bombs. These early missiles had limited range and therefore the Soviet Union could not fire a missile and hit the United States. It was looking for missile bases close enough to the United States to be able to attack if necessary. 
and they found that forward position in Cuba. They began to build missile uh, sites in Cuba with the purpose of having a, a nuclear capability that could hit the United States. Using the U-2 spy planes, the United States found out that the Soviet Union was building missile bases in Cuba. The question was what to do. Some in the military wanted to invade immediately before those bases became operational. Others were afraid this would trigger World War III. President Kennedy decided to try diplomacy and intermediate action. He ordered the Navy to blockade Cuba, to stop any ship that was headed for Cuba and inspect its cargo. If it contained material for these nuclear bases, that ship was to be turned around and not allowed to get to Cuba. Of course, what would have happened if these ships had defied the United States Navy? Would they have sunk the ships? This was a true brinksmanship moment when the wrong move could start World War III. Kennedy went on television and delivered a speech that basically said, Soviet Union, you must stop putting missiles in Cuba. And that if you do, and any of those missiles are used to attack any country in the Western Hemisphere, we will consider that a declaration of war on the United States and respond accordingly. Behind the scenes, however, he was using diplomacy. And he found a way to make a deal with the Soviet Union. The key to that deal was the range of the existing missiles. The missiles that the Soviet Union was putting in Cuba could maybe reach as far as Washington, D.C. or Dallas Southeast. The United States had deployed similar missiles surrounding the Soviet Union, like in Turkey. However, the United States had come up with a longer range missile, making those missiles that were stationed in Turkey obsolete. So what President Kennedy was able to do was to make a deal with the Soviet Union. We would remove our missiles from Turkey if the Soviet Union would remove its missiles from Cuba. We also pledged not to invade Cuba. What Khrushchev didn't know was that the United States had developed a new set of missiles with longer range that made those missiles in Turkey obsolete. Therefore, he was trading his most sophisticated weapons for obsolete weapons. When this was found out several years later, it cost Khrushchev his job as the head of the Soviet Union. So the combination of Kennedy's blockade of Cuba and his negotiation of a deal with the Soviet Union basically eased the tensions that could have caused World War III over Cuba. To the American people, however, this Cuban Missile Crisis scared most people. The military was called to active duty, put on high alert, and as you see here, the citizens were saying, President Kennedy, be careful. Try to let the UN handle the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
But the one sign I want you to notice in this picture says peace or perish. And that was a growing belief in the United States, that if we did not find a way to work out our differences peacefully, the world was going to be destroyed in a nuclear holocaust. As the arms race continued, each side developed what were called ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. These were missiles that could be fired from any place in the world and hit any other place in the world. From a silo in Kansas, we could put an atomic warhead on Moscow, for example. The Soviet Union was doing the same thing. And therefore, you didn't need those forward bases like had caused so much trouble in Cuba. This increased the anxiety about the possibility of an atomic attack. In fact, there were even plans for a first strike. The military estimating that uh, for, if we shot first with our ICBMs, we could disable most of the Soviet capability and it would only cost the United States a few million killed in the retaliation. Fortunately, no one tested that theory. In another Cold War confrontation, the city of Berlin was still divided into an American section and the section controlled by the Soviet Union. The problem was that people were fleeing the Soviet section for the Western section and then being transported out to West Germany. They were fleeing the communist country. And the communists felt like they had to stop this exodus of people from East Berlin to West Berlin. So they built a wall. This was the problem with just barricades. Here's a soldier, an East German soldier fleeing to the West by just simply jumping over a barricade. This then forced the Soviet Union to begin to build a solid wall that would pre prevent people from communist section of Germany fleeing to the West. The wall was complete with guard stations like a prison, a no man's land around the wall that if anybody went into that area, they could be shot. The Soviet Union was serious about separating East from West, but that wall also became a symbol of the Cold War. And when in the late 1980s, that wall came down, it symbolized the end of the Cold War. The wall also had places where war could start at any second. One wrong shot might mean war. These were the pass-throughs from the wall. Where, it was, where if you had the proper papers, you could legally move from East Berlin to West Berlin and vice versa. This is the infamous Checkpoint Charlie. This was the most used of these entrances and exits. But at both, on both sides, you had soldiers facing down each other with tanks and guns and cannons. One wrong move, one wrong shot could have been the spark that started World War III. The major shooting war 
of the Cold War was in Vietnam. It was an American attempt to stop the spread of communism or contain communism and stop the dominoes from falling. Remember the domino theory that if one country falls to communism, then its neighbors are going to fall to communism. That was the rationale for United States involvement in Vietnam. We got into the war when the French failed. Following World War II, the French had tried to reclaim their former colony, French Indochina. However, a group of nationalists who wanted Vietnam to be a free country and not a French colony began to fight the French army. This ended at Dien Bien Phu, where the rebels under Ho Chi Minh defeated the French army and forced France to leave Vietnam. Like Korea after World War II, Vietnam had been divided north and south. The north had developed a communist regime under Ho Chi Minh. The south had developed a pro-Western government under a leader named Diem. It was Ho Chi Minh's attempt to reunify the country by driving the French out and then taking over the rest of the country for his own leadership, supported by communist China, that led to American involvement in Vietnam. When Diem saw that there was a threat of losing all of Vietnam to Ho Chi Minh, he came to the United States for help. This was in the 1950s. President Eisenhower agreed to provide training for the South Vietnamese military. He sent in American advisors not to fight, but to train the South Vietnamese army how to fight off the threat from North Vietnam. American troops training the South Vietnamese army proved not to be sufficient to withstand the threat of the North. And so gradually the United States began to send in troops not to fight, but as support for the South Vietnamese army. One of the problems was that the North was using guerrilla warfare tactics, using supporters in South Vietnam to uh, attack and then disappear back into the jungle. There were protests in the South against the war and particularly against the Diem regime that was turning very quickly into a dictatorship. He su supported the United States and the United States supported him. But the people of South Vietnam began to question this dictatorship. Some of the leaders of these protests were Buddhist monks. Here you see one of the forms of protest. A monk walked into a public square, poured gasoline over himself and set himself on fire. One of the interesting things about this picture is that you have the South Vietnamese military or police officer standing there simply watching, about to light a cigarette as this Buddhist monk burns to death. This was symbolic of the indifference that the Diem regime had about the ordinary people of Vietnam. He sent his military into these Buddhist uh, churches and rounded up Buddhist priests 
Well, this was bad publicity for the United States because they were using American produced weapons, uniforms, all that kind of thing. So it seemed like the United States was attacking Buddhist, the Buddhist religion. And so it was very bad publicity. And the United States finally decided Diem had become a problem. They offered him an agreement to leave the country and turn over rule to someone else. Diem refused to leave. And so the CIA helped plan and execute a coup by the military. This is what was left of Diem after the coup. The military takes control of South Vietnam. Now this was not the first time that the CIA had participated in overthrowing governments that they deemed not friendly to the United States. The same thing had happened in Iran, where the CIA helped overthrow the existing government and put into place the Shah of Iran, as he was called, who would become an absolute, one of the most absolute brutal dictators in the world. But he was on the American side. This is one of the huge blind spots of American Cold War policy. We would support brutal dictators as long as they were pro-Western, as long as they were anti-communist. We ignored their violation of human rights. And this will become a major problem, particularly in the Middle East. The escalation of American troops during the fighting in Vietnam resulted in large measure from an incident in the Gulf of Tonkin. We had spy ships sailing off the coast of North Vietnam, listening to radio transmissions and spying on what the North was doing. One night during a storm, a radar operator on one of these American ships sounded the alarm that they were under attack by torpedoes. They reported this to Washington, took evasive action. Nobody was hit because there were no torpedoes. It was a blip because of the weather. Within 12 hours, they had reported back to Washington that no, they had not been attacked. However, President Lyndon Johnson used this attack to go to Congress and ask for a resolution that gave him a virtual blank check to fight a full out war in Vietnam. So the Gulf of Tonkin resolutions passed by Congress on the false belief that we, our ships were being attacked helps Johnson escalate the war. As is my custom, I'm not going to fight the battles of the Vietnam War. I want to concentrate more on the soldiers that fought them. Remember, there was a draft in the United States. When a young man turned 18, he had to register for the draft. And he could be drafted into the military whether he wanted to go or not. There was no volunteering. And so the average age of the soldiers in Vietnam was 19 years old. Average age of the American soldier in World War II was about 27. So these are basically kids. And I want you to imagine what they went through. They go through their draft process. They show up for basic training. They get a couple of weeks off. They're sent for advanced training, get a couple of weeks off, 
and then they're told to report usually to either Seattle or Oakland, where they're put on an airplane and flown to Vietnam. When they get off the airplane, they are sent to their unit. They are not sent over as units. They not, do not come back as units. They basically go as individuals. And so someone could be out for a night on the town in the United States, and within a week, someone's trying to kill him in a war. That's the kind of culture shock that these troops experienced. This had never been uh, the case before because most of the time, whole groups of men, units, divisions, had gone to war as a group. They had gotten on ships, they had sailed, they'd fought, they'd gotten back on ships as a group and come home, not Vietnam. With air travel, they could literally go from being in the United States to being dead. And it was an unconventional type of war. Yes, North Vietnam, Vietnam had a regular army, as did South Vietnam. But so many times what the American troops ran into was guerrilla warfare. For example, they never knew who was an enemy and who wasn't. This woman, they're asking her which day did, way did the bad guys go, and she's pointing off. But they have no clue whether once they say thank you and they go on, she might pull a grenade out of the baby's diaper and kill them. That's the kind of war it was. There were no front lines. They didn't know who the enemy was for sure. And they would fight over the same ground over and over again. They would go in and take a position and fight off the Vietnamese in that area and then abandon that position and the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong as the guerrilla fighters were called would move right back in. And so six months later, a year later, they might have to go and fight for the same ground. It really did not make a lot of sense to many of the troops stationed there. Because American troops were not sure of who the enemy was and who was a, an innocent civilian, they resorted to the tactics that they had used before in guerrilla fighting. And that is basically rounding up people in different villages, shipping them off to someplace else, and then destroying their village. It was called a Zippo War because many of these structures were made of bamboo or wood. And so the soldiers would use Zippo lighters to burn down entire villages. These were called search and destroy missions. Search for the enemy, get the civilians out of the way so that you knew that anyone who was left in the area was an enemy combatant. Another way to try to prevent guerrillas from attacking was to take out the jungles where they hid. And so the United States sprayed millions of gallons of uh, defoliant called Agent Orange on the jungles to kill the jungles so that they would know <clears throat> where the enemy was. What they didn't know at first was that many times the enemy was hiding underground. The Viet Cong, the guerrilla fighters against the United States and South Vietnam, 
had intricate series of tunnels. They had whole cities underground, complete with hospitals. And so when the United States would bomb an area or destroy the, the jungle, the guerrillas were still there. They were just hiding underground. It turns out that Agent Orange was a cancer causer also. And many Vietnam vets in the years following coming home came down with cancer. At first, the government refused to recognize that Agent Orange was a cancer-causing agent. And so they refused treatment for these veterans. Ultimately, however, it was proven and the VA had to begin to provide treatment for the cancer caused by Agent Orange. Unlike other wars, <clears throat> American troops were sent to Vietnam for a set period of time, usually a year. So they would fly in, they would go into battle. After six months, they would get R&R, &R, rest and relaxation, or they might be flown out to Hawaii <clears throat> or to Australia. They might be sitting on a beach, sipping an umbrella drink for two weeks, and then boom, they're right back in the war. They could cross off on a calendar how many days they had left till they were going to get to go back to the United States, or as they called it, back to the world. And so they had expressions. I've got three days in a wake up. In other words, I've got three more days in country. And on the fourth day, when I wake up, I get on a plane and go home. <clears throat> but the problems continued once they got home because they would be met by scenes like this from the anti-war pro protesters, calling them baby killers, calling them uh, criminals, no respect by the anti-war movement for their service in Vietnam. When the soldiers came home, the anti-war groups blamed the soldiers for the war and abused them. I remember one soldier telling me that as soon as he landed in San Francisco, the first place he went was a wig shop and bought him a wig so nobody could tell that he had a GI haircut. This, I am convinced, is one of the reasons why the United States has become so supportive of our veterans today. Baby boomers who were part of the anti-war movement realize that they were blaming the soldiers when the real people to blame were the politicians in Washington. And so they're trying to make up for it. But that did not help the Vietnam vet coming home. The military did very little to readjust those veterans back into civilian society. They were pretty much left on their own to adjust. And this is one of the reasons why there were so many cases of PTSD and other psychological disorders from the Vietnam War. A major turning point in public opinion about the war came with the Tet Offensive in 1968. The American government had been telling the people, we are winning the war. Well, how do you know that you're winning a guerrilla war. There are no front lines, there's no territory taken. And so the military had, re, had used body counts. How many dead 
Vietnamese do you find to prove that we were winning the war? However, during the Tet New Year's holiday, 1968, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong staged a massive offensive against every major city in South Vietnam. They got into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, supposedly the most secure place in the entire country. Here you see dead Viet Cong soldiers within the grounds of the U.S. Embassy. They caught the United States by surprise. And the United States quickly got their act together and began to push back and ultimately stop the Tet Offensive. What we didn't know was that the North Vietnamese had thrown virtually every military asset they had into the Tet Offensive. Once we had turned the corner, if we had just moved and invaded the North, we could have practically walked into Hanoi, the capital of North Vietnam, but we didn't know that. And so once we stopped the attacks in the South, we stopped to regroup. But because the American people had been told You're win we're winning the war, and then they see the Tet Offensive where it doesn't look like we are winning, they begin to question the word of the United States government. Another thing that begins to prey on the minds of the American public are scenes like this. The man with a gun is the chief of police of Saigon. He's on our side. He has captured a Viet Cong guerrilla during the Tet Offensive. And right in front of the news media, in fact, you can find video of this if you want to see the gruesome details. He executes this prisoner with his hands tied behind his back. And so the American people see scenes like this and they begin to go, is this what we're fighting for? And so public opinion begins to shift against the war. Other realities of the war begin to find their way into the press. The American people see, for example, what happened in the village of Milai and begin to ask, is this why we're there? What happened was a platoon of US soldiers was attacked by guerrilla fighters, killing a couple of them, wounding a couple. They began to pursue these guerrilla fighters through the war. The guerrilla fighters ran into the town, the village of Milai. When the American troops got there, they surrounded the village, brought everybody out, and they couldn't tell if the guerrilla fighters were still there, if they had just run through the village. So basically they executed the entire village, men, women, and children. This was part of the huge problem of fighting a guerrilla war where you truly did not know who the enemy was. But when word of me lie and, and other incidents like it began to get out to the American public, the American public began to question even more. Why are we there? The Tet Offensive proved to be a turning point in American public opinion about the war. Shortly after the offensive, the most trusted man in news, Walter Cronkite of the CBS Evening News, went to Vietnam and did a series of reports. When he got home, he did an editorial, the first editorial he had ever done in all of his years of broadcasting. And in that editorial, he questioned whether we were really winning the war. 
and questioned what our purpose was, what the goal of this was. President Lyndon Johnson was watching that telecast that night and heard Walter Cronkite question the war. He turned to an aide and he said, if we've lost Walter Cronkite, we've lost the war. And a few months later, Lyndon Johnson would announce that he was not running for re-election for president of the United States. I will let Crash Course do a summary of the Cold War in Southeast Asia and point out that even though public opinion began to turn against the war in greater and greater numbers in 1968, the war would continue for several years before finally the United States withdrew from Vietnam. <laughs> 